that in a little bit. Today is communion, and I'm going to talk about the new covenant. Um, I want to I want to just say this: when you study in seminary or Bible college, and you're developing doctrines or you're studying different doctrines of the Bible, it's really important to try not to take a passage or even a doctrine out of its context. And a doctrine is something, a, a major teaching in the Bible that you're taking from the entire Bible. So when we talk about the new covenant and we talk about salvation, we want to understand it as the whole Bible teaches it from Genesis to Revelation, not just in the New Testament. New Testament actually means new covenant. Um, but the new covenant was promised in the Old Testament, and the new covenant has a background, and so we're going to talk about that. Before we do, let's pray. And I'd like to take just a moment of silent prayer, because we're all sheep, and the Bible says that we just need stillness, quietness, peace, even in our souls, to receive from the Lord, to be nurtured in the Word, um, to be refreshed by the water of the Word. We need that in our souls. You might have walked in this morning and you've got stuff on your mind and you're, you might be wound up about something, or you might even be sinning um, with a bad mental attitude or something like that. Now is the time to humble ourselves before the Lord, confess any known sin, the scripture says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we can be cleansed now so that God the Holy Spirit can minister to us. Because if you've placed your faith in Christ, God lives inside you and he knows everything that's going on in your soul. You can't hide anything. So he's the one that is going to help you process these things as we study the word of God. So let's just take a moment of silent prayer. And then I'll open up in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we praise you because your love, your good, your righteous, your true, your unchanging, your eternal, your sovereign, your just, your holy. But because you are love, you are compelled to have relationship and fellowship with us the men and women, boys and girls that are created in your image. We praise you. We're in the middle of a study on salvation that has um, shown us how we can have the utmost confidence and courage and even boldness in this so great salvation that you've given to us. We have come together to solemnly and reverently remember our Lord Jesus Christ, his death for our sins, his burial, his resurrection, and his coming again. We thank you for this time. We love you, Father. We commit this time to you and just pray that you would speak to each one of us individually. Um, along with our children when they're dismissed to Children's Church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you can flip that. Um, I'm going to read a passage from Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 31, which is the promise of the new covenant in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 31. It says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
So new covenant as opposed to old covenant. All right. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. God made a covenant to Israel. And you all know about the Exodus where he brought them out of the land. And they, they went to Egypt. I'm sorry. They went to Mount Sinai. And God gave them, the Israelites, through Moses, he gave them the law, the law of Moses, we call it. That's the old covenant. But God gave them this law, and he told them, he made a promise to them, or a covenant, which was conditional. He said, look, if you obey this law, when you get into the promised land, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you in the land. When you obey this law, if you disobey this law, I'm going to curse you. Have you ever done that to your children? Look, if you do this, I'm going to bless you. You're going to get this, this, that, or the other. Okay, maybe money for report cards or something like that. However, if you don't, you're going to get disciplined. If you don't get the grade that I think you should get in algebra, you're going to be, you're not going to be able to go out for six weeks. Um, my dad, my dad, <laughs> my dad usually associated with some kind of work in the yard. He made us work, and he got something done. He killed two birds with one stone, and we worked all the time because I was dumb as a rock. But anyway, discipline's going to be associated with disobedience, and blessing's going to be associated with obedience. It's part of training in a relationship, and that was the covenant that God made with Israel. Blessing. For obedience to the law, discipline for disobedience to the law. Well, look in verse 32. He's saying, it's, this new covenant, verse 32, is not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand um, out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make, this is the new covenant, with the house of Israel, after those days, declares the Lord, I'll put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. I will be their God, and they will be my people. What is God wanting here? Is he just wanting a bunch of good robots that do, do, does the things that he says? He's wanting relationship, because he is love. He just wants relationship. He wants fellowship. He knows that sin violates that relationship, just like Sin in your relationships violate the fellowship. And it ha things have to be made right before the relationship can be made right. He just wants fellowship in this new law. And he talks about how he will forgive their sin. And then in Ezekiel chapter 36, he associates this new covenant with the land. Now look, look up here at the, at the thing. You can see at the first coming of Christ, when he died on, a cro on the cross... He inaugurated this covenant, and that's what we celebrate in communion. And he gives us three things. When we place our faith in Christ, Jew or Gentile, we get forgiveness of sins, a new heart, and the indwelling Holy Spirit. Think about Israel going, um, wandering in the wilderness, and then when they got in the land, they were under the judges, and, and then they got kings, and they were under the kings for about 350 years, under the judges for about 350 years. And the whole time, and in the wilderness for 40 years, the whole time they kept going through that cycle of discipline where they were blessed for obedience, and then they let go of the Lord, and they neglected the word, and they lapsed into disobedience, and God disciplined them for disobedience. It caused pain, and then there was repentance, and then God restored them, and then they were blessed for obedience, and they let go of the Lord. And they let go of the word of God and they formed bad habits when they were prosperous. And God warned them by the prophets, don't do this, don't do this. But then they did this and they lapsed into disobedience and rebellion. And God judged them again and they, it caused a lot of pain. And they repented from their sin and God restored them. And they just, this became their history over and over and over again. They kept breaking this covenant. What do they need? Well, they certainly need forgiveness for all the rebellion. But they need a new heart. And God says, I'm going to give you forgiveness in this new covenant. I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to put my Holy Spirit inside you, which is the most intimate thing that God could ever do for a human. He doesn't even do this for the angels. 
The angels, apparently, they well, there's nothing that we can tell in the scriptures where the angels have God, the Holy Spirit, living inside them. But we do. And there absolutely is nothing. The scripture clearly says that we're the ones seated with Jesus Christ at his right hand, not the angels. And we are in Jesus Christ, not the angels. It's just amazing what God has done through this new covenant. But forgiveness of sins, his Holy Spirit living in us, and a new heart. But God also says that, listen, under that old covenant, he said, if you keep rebelling against me, I'm just going to remove you from the land. I'm going to scatter you to the nations as discipline. Under this new covenant, he says, I'm going to bring you back. Because my promise to Abraham is eternal. I'm going to bring you back to the promised land that I promised Abraham. Look in Ezekiel 36. This is Ezekiel 36, verse 26. Kids, bear with me. I'm almost almost done. Okay. Ezekiel 36, 26. And now, listen. In Ezekiel, the Israelites are in captivity in Babylon. They've already been carried off into captivity. And this is what God promises them there. Moreover, I will give you a new heart, this is the new covenant, and put a new spirit within you. And I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to obey my ordinances. And then look what he says in verse 28. And you will live in the land that I, give to, that I gave to your forefathers. And you will be my people and I will be your God. And he talks about the blessing, the prosperity that they'll experience when they're back in the land. But if you look up at the thing, it says that this new covenant is consummated or, or completed at Jesus' second coming, okay? Where it says that Israel will be restored to the land, and then the Davidic king or the Messianic king will be sent by God. Now, he was sent the first time, wasn't he? And they, they said, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king, son of David. And they were worshiping him, but that was just a remnant of people. And then the leaders, or the nation led by the leaders, ended up a week later saying, we'll have no king but Caesar. And Jesus was crucified at the hands of the Israelites. Okay, And the nation was judged once again. But then the good news of Jesus Christ went to the Gentiles, that's you and I, and we wouldn't be sitting here had not the Jews rejected Christ. We're going to get into this in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. But it says that that Israel is going to be restored to the land, and the Davidic king or the Messianic king is going to be sent, and then he's going to establish his kingdom. We call it the Messianic kingdom. In the Um, Revelation chapter 20, we realize or see that that kingdom is for 1,000 years. You could say phase one of the kingdom is for 1,000 years, where Jesus Christ comes back and he establishes himself as the King of kings and the Lord of lords over this vile world. We're going to talk about that in a minute when the kids are gone. Okay, but um, right now we're going to we're going to celebrate communion. We're going to remember his death. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26, until he comes, okay? And so it shows that the church is in the middle of the first coming and the second coming of Christ. That we stand on this so great salvation that was won for us at the cross, but we anticipate Jesus coming and literally delivering this world from evil or saving this world, and us included, at his second coming, okay? So can we have the elders, and I've asked a couple other guys to come on up, and Harold, come on up, and these three, we got five. I thought there were five things. Okay, all right. Okay, and if you'll just take this and hold on to it, and then we will take together.
I'm in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. You can just listen along. Paul said, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul says in verse 25, in the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul goes on to say, he says, for as often as you eat this bread, and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us from all sin, that we might have peace with God. We acknowledge that we live in this body of flesh and that it's our responsibility or it's our calling as children of the Most High to walk in faith, to trust you, to listen to and understand, to understand and listen to your word, that we might live lives that are pleasing to you. That's our desire. We want to be faithful. We thank you, God, that our salvation undergirds us in our times of faithfulness and in unfaithfulness. We thank you for your, your mercy and your grace. We want to keep the Lord Jesus Christ prominent in our hearts and our minds until we see the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, the children can be dismissed. As the kids are leaving, I want to give a, a gentle encouragement. That's, that's an exhortation. I want to encourage you to be reading the Bible, through the Bible, um, reading it from Genesis to Revelation. I would encourage you to do it every year, read through the Bible every year. If you can't do that, do it in two years or even three years. If you read through the Bible in three years, you're really only reading for about three minutes a day, okay? And you'll read through the whole Bible in three years. And there's all kinds of reading programs you can do. And it might be good just to start something like that. And so you get into a habit. And once you get into habit, you can bump it up to five minutes and read it in two years. It's just that easy. Um, and then ultimately, you'll get addicted to reading through the Bible. But reading through the whole Bible, what it does is it helps you not take passages out of context and it helps you read passages within the broader context of the whole Bible. It also helps you to to think more theologically and not um, and not categorize things so tightly so that they don't integrate. Does that make sense? If you think of the whole body as one organic whole because God is the author. Big A, God is the author. And he spoke through 40 different men. Um, and there's 66 different books. And it's written 
on three different continents over 1,500 years in three different languages and under a, just a slew of different cultural circumstances. And so there are thousands of contexts within the, the Bible. And so to take a passage in its context is really important. You have to understand the context. But if there's one big author behind all the little authors and he has a design and a plan, you're going to see it. And it's perfect. Every word of God is flawless because all the words of God, every word is God-breathed and is profitable. So what does that mean? Well, just like your physical body is perfectly integrated, um, and if you were to take a, an organ out of your physical body and hold it like your kidney here or your liver here, it would be out of its context and have no purpose whatsoever. But put in, in your body, it's perfectly integrated. And so every doctrine, every person in the Bible, every story in the Bible, every poem in the Bible, every metaphor in the Bible, it all fits together with an organic unity perfectly. And so when you're reading through the Bible every year, every two or three years or whatever, but you're, you continue to read through the Bible until when? Until you, you die. Thank you. And if you can't see, you listen to it on tape. But when you're doing that, you're studying the whole body of the scripture. It's kind of like a general practitioner. You know, you have a lot of doctors that are specialists and they specialize in one certain thing. But a GP, he's got to know the whole body and how it's all integrated. And the scripture never calls us to be specialists. It calls us to be general practitioners as far as pastors are concerned, understanding the whole counsel of God. But for the believer, this is going to help you understand the scriptures. When you come to the doctrine of salvation, it's very important to understand what the Bible says from G to R on the doctrine of salvation. Men's Bible study, we've been going through this on Tuesday mornings. When you study, if you get a concordance out and you look up every time it says salvation or deliverance, man, it is loaded in the Old Testament. And most of the times in the Old Testament that talk about salvation, and I believe also in the New Testament, but most of the times in the Old Testament, the salvation or deliverance that's being spoken of is relative or related to the second coming of Christ and the day of the Lord. That Israel is going to be delivered, and all those believers are going to be delivered from the wrath of the, of the Messiah, of God, coming on the earth in the events preceding the day of the Lord and then the day of the Lord. But anyway, I want to ask you a question. Are you tired of seeing the pathetically depraved descent, that means going down, of this world system into evil? Are you tired of seeing all that on the TV? Makes you sick. And that's a good uh, litmus test for you. If you're growing in the Lord and you get sick when you see something that's just depraved or sinful or evil, on TV or the computer or whatever like that, that's a pretty good test. Okay, you're green, you're growing, you're moving forward. Jesus is the answer. We would tell everybody, <clears throat> yeah, Jesus is the answer. He died on the cross for your sins. He's the answer to forgive your sins and he, God raised him from the dead. You're going to die in your sins, but he gives you eternal life. So he, sin and death are our two biggest problems and he gives us forgiveness and eternal life. And all of that is true. And our eternal salvation that we receive because of the cross is how we enter into this Christian life and we become sanctified. But the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again. He's the only one that can save us eternally, die for our sins, okay, being raised again. But he's also the only one that can save this vile world. The word salvation and deliverance are virtually synonymous in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. But he's the only one that can deliver us from sin and forgive us our sins. But he's also the only one that can deliver this world from evil. Does that make sense? He's the, wish he'd hurry. Yep, me too. He's this world's only hope. And he will do it. That's why we don't despair when we see what's going on in the world. We don't despair. 
we know the king is coming. I want to read from Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. So turn with me to Isaiah chapter 59. Now remember, our study is in Romans, and we're in Romans chapter 5, but I'm just tying the new covenant into our study in Romans. But Isaiah 59... I want you to think of this passage. It's really interesting. This is, the, this is the Romans 3 of the Old Testament. It's talking about the depravity of man. But if you'll notice in this passage, and I would encourage you to sit in this passage for a little bit and just kind of soak, soak it in. But if you'll notice in this passage, it's talking about our individual depravity. Yes, absolutely. But it's also talking about the depravity of the world system around us. And the fact that Because we are, listen close, y'all, because we are made in the image of God and God is righteous and true and just, we have this sense of morality in ourselves and we look around in the world and we think, this just isn't right. Even though we're really a part of the problem, we're sinners, we look at the world and we think, this is messed up. Even the most depraved people will look at this world and say, man, that's messed up. This is messed up. Look what it says. Look in verse 10. Look at verse 9. Well, therefore, justice is far from us. Righteousness does not overtake us. This is, these are desperate statements. We hope for light, but behold, darkness. We hope for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope along the wall like blind men. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at midday as in twilight. Among those who are vigorous, we are like dead men. All of us growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it's far from us. You know, if you understand the context of this, he's talking about there's in, always in Israel, there's a remnant of Jews that are doing what is right. They're walking in righteousness. They're walking in obedience to the law. And, and there's always a, a non-remnant that are in rebellion. Sometimes the Sometimes the remnant grows and Israel is under a tremendous time of blessing like David and under Solomon and and Asa and Hezekiah and different kings. But much of the time they spent their, their, their lives with this remnant striving with the, the bulk of the nation in rebellion against God. But also the Canaanite, the, the people that they were living around were just depraved. It says... We hope for salvation, but there's none. Verse 12, for our transgressions are multiplied before you, God. Our sins testify against us. Now remember, they're still crying out for justice, but they're not seeing any. They're not seeing any. For our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities, transgressing and denying the Lord and turning away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving in and uttering from the heart lying words, and justice is turned back, and righteousness stands far away. This really is in keeping with the Mosaic Covenant. Paul, God says that, hey, I'm going to hold back. I'm going to pull away if you don't walk with me, and I'm going to let you become a product of your own decisions. Okay, the, the law of natural consequences. Verse 14, for truth, at the end of verse 14, for truth has stumbled in the street, and uprightness cannot enter. Yes, truth is lacking, and he who turns himself from evil makes himself a prey. Now he's talking about the remnant there. The one who wants to walk in righteousness, he becomes attacked. Have you ever seen that? Say yes. We see that a lot, okay? People who are walking in righteousness get attacked. You see it mostly in the news, okay? But listen, look what happens. Verse 15. Now the Lord saw, and it was displeasing in his sight, that there was no justice. And he saw that there was no man, and was astonished that there was no one to intercede. In other words, nobody can deliver this world from evil. This is a geopolitical problem, okay? And it's a personal problem. Every single one of us are sinners, And none of us can help. Not even the best of the man, not even the best of us can intervene, can change this, can stop this. 
Look what it says in the middle of verse 16. Then his own arm brought salvation to him. Notice, isn't that weird? Did God need to get saved here? What is he talking about? His own arm brought salvation to him. I want you to think about this. God made this world, didn't he? He made this world. God, God made man and put man on this world. And he says, I want you to be fruitful and multiply, fill this earth and subdue it. I'm giving it to him. Adam was bequeathed the world and God gave it to him. And man submitted his will, Adam, to the enemy. And Satan, the enemy of all enemies, began building his kingdom on this earth. For, for 4,000 years up to the cross, where he, he offered the entire world and all its glory, all the power, dominion, and, and glory, and the nations and everything, he offered that to Jesus Christ. In Matthew 4 and in Luke chapter 4, he said, all of this has been handed over to me and I give it to him, whomever I wish. He had, Satan had the whole world in his hand and he is a horrible, when he gets hold of an individual, He's a, he steals, kills, and destroys. When he gets hold of a marriage, destroyed. A family, destroyed. A nation, a company, um, a business, a neighborhood association, doesn't matter, a school, destroyed. He's the destroyer. What's my point? God made this world. He put man on this world. He loves man. Man's made in his own image. And this world is in a... a a crash, it, it's a big train wreck. Guess whose problem it is? It's God's problem. It's God's problem. And he's going to own it right here. It says, it says, then his own arm brought salvation to him and his righteousness upheld him and he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation, there's that word salvation again, on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. Does this sound like the baby in the manger? This is not the first coming of Christ. This is the second coming of Christ, okay? Look that up in Zechariah chapter 14 and there's so many other passages. There's notes here in the front if you want them. Chapter eight, verse 18, according to their works... He will repay, so he will repay wrath to his enemies, recompense to his wrath to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the coastlands, he will make recompense. He's going to make it all right, but there's going to be judgment. And this is talking about the second coming leading into the day of the Lord. So they will fear the name of the Lord from the west. Let's just say, I try to try to think, well, where's the west? The from the coast of California. That's the West. I'm not making this up. And his glory from the rising of the sun. That's the East. That's all the way to the East. That's to China. From the coast of California, all the way through China to Japan, to the Bering Strait, his, what does it say? He will come like a rushing stream, which the wind of the Lord drives. I can't read it. I know. I need a new Bible. What's the first word? And a redeemer? And a redeemer will come to Zion. And to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. By the way, the anti-Semitism that the Jews have experienced for 3,500 years now and will experience up until and through the tribulation period, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. He's coming first to Zion. He's coming first to Zion to deliver them. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit which is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, both now and forever. This is the new covenant reiterated that he's going to put his Holy Spirit in the Israelites, okay? And they're going to enjoy fellowship with the Lord forever and ever. But this passage and so many others, I would encourage you to study Psalm 96, 97, and 98, or 97, 98, 90, 96 to 98. Psalm 96 to 98. The coming of the Lord 
is clearly, consistently throughout the Old Testament, um, connected to salvation and deliverance. Salvation and deliverance. So Jesus is coming again as the second Adam to establish his kingdom. What does that look like? We can only imagine Jesus coming and wrenching the power and the authority and the dominion and the influence over this world, over all the nations, the governments, every national and international entity, um, every social or geopolitical moral or educational, economic, agricultural, zoological, e ecological entity. Every group of humans on the earth, no matter where they are, no matter what they're doing, the power of the enemy, the evil that has driven them to where they are now, will be removed, and Satan, that's Satan, and his fallen angels will be put in what is called the abyss or the bottomless pit. This is Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 6. Satan will be incarcerated. So the influencer or the power of dominion over all these things, over the world, will be removed and there'll be a new influencer. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We can only imagine what this is going to be like. This is going to be salvation or deliverance for the world from evil. Let me put it a little different way. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for sins. There's nothing in the scripture that says Jesus died for evil on the cross. Well, what is evil? It's Satan's distorted lies and his modus operandi for control over any entity. He wants control over your personal life, over your marriage, over the church. He wants, his, wants control over any kind of entity, over a university, over a kindergarten. It doesn't matter. Over a business. He wants dominion. And the ways and means that the enemy uses that to gain dominion is called evil. Jesus didn't die for evil. He died for sin. Does evil include sin? Of course it does. But at the second coming, he's going to deal with evil and wickedness in the world. And he's going to loose the chains and the tyranny of the world. He's going to take that off. And he's going to bring in and issue in everlasting righteousness and truth and peace. He's going to reestablish his ever-redeeming truth, righteousness, and grace in this world. Isn't that good? So you can watch the news and you can go on and get all upset. I do. We throw sh I, I've never thrown shoes at the television. But we, we get all upset. But we know the King of Kings is coming. And what's your MO and my MO? To walk with Him. Just to walk with Him. We want to be faithful throughout our life and then we want to die. We want to hear Him say, well done my good and faithful servant. Enter into my joy. Enter into the glory of the kingdom. It's going to be glorious. And the horrific pain and suffering that we see today and we are witnessing is going to get worse and it's going to continue up through the tribulation period. I want to read from Revelation 21. Revelation 21. After the Messianic kingdom, after the thousand-year reign of Christ, it says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. This is verse 1, Revelation 21, 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. That's like all the Pacific Ocean is all land, mountains, ranges. It's going to be amazing. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be among them. That means God's going to be in the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem is going to come down to the earth, and God 
His dwelling place is going to be with man. That's never been the case in all of eternity except when Jesus came in the flesh. And then Jesus reigned on the earth during the millennial kingdom. But God himself is going to be here on the earth in the new Jerusalem. Verse 4, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death, nor will there no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. He who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. That is not the case today. We quote this oftentimes at funerals and things like that, but it's not the case today. Certainly when you're absent from the body and present with the Lord, he's wiping away all the tears and everything, but there's a thousand years of human history coming in the age to come. We will be a part of that in the age to come. And it will be a difficult regency. It will be blessing throughout all the earth. But it would be a difficult regency that ends in another rebellion. You just need to read Revelation chapter 21. I mean 20. And you'll see that. But I want you to know, and I'm saying all that, because our passage in Romans 5, it's talking about the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. But when we get to verse 11, verse 9 and, 11, 9 and 10, it's also talking about the second coming. And we miss that. We miss that if we don't understand some of the things we just talked about. Okay, so, take, so let's go back to Romans. Romans chapter 5. It started out in verse 1, we've been reconciled to God, we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God, and it was through Jesus Christ or through faith in Jesus Christ, we've walked through that door, if you will, of salvation into the room of grace, we we've stand in this grace, and we glory in the blessing that God has given to us, signed, sealed, and delivered through the blood of Jesus Christ. We exult in that, we glory in that, we boast in that. And then it says in verse 3, but not only that, we glory or we boast in our tribulation. We talked about this last week, how our tribulation changes our character, and ultimately that's where the, the love of Jesus Christ is poured into our hearts. And so we, we glory in that, we boast in that. But then it says in verse 6, for while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Let's read through verse 11. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we will be saved from the wrath of of God through him. But if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through his death, through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. First of all, in verse six, it says, while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Think back to Isaiah 59. We and all society were helpless in fixing the situation. And the word he uses here is just without strength, okay, without vigor, living in a state of weakness. We couldn't help it. And what's so interesting in Isaiah 59, they could even look around and see how wrong it is, or they could even look inside and see how wrong they are and couldn't help themselves and couldn't help anyone else. They were strengthless. And that's why God saw and his own arm brought salvation. It says anyway, in verse 6, it says, While we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. <laughs> And this word means the opposite of being reverent, okay? If someone is reverent or they're God-fearing, this is just the opposite. And that's who Jesus died for. The impious, ungodly, or the wicked. Someone who won't respect or have reverence toward what is holy. That's from the dictionary. 
and we couldn't help ourselves. But he died for us. What is this? Well, this is substitutionary atonement. Jesus died for me. I didn't die for myself. That would be the lake of fire. He died for me. He paid for all of my sins. It's interesting in Romans chapter 4 verse 5, it says that God justifies the ungodly. The one who doesn't work but believes, God justifies the ungodly. Just really quick, justification is getting his perfect righteousness, okay? And that's God's grace. That's something positive we don't, we don't, we don't deserve. But when substitution is God's mercy, we're not getting the death or the penalty or the judgment that we did deserve. That's mercy. It's like two sides of the same coin. Grace is getting something good we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting something bad that we do deserve. Christ got the judgment so we could get the forgiveness. That's mercy. Jesus Christ was perfectly righteous. He became sinful so that we could become righteous. That's grace. That God give, giving us grace. But here it says that Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 7. It says, For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps... One will hardly die for a righteous man. Though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in, what, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you before you were even born, right? Before you could even turn to the Lord or not turn to the Lord. He died for how many people on the whole earth? A hundred percent, we call this unlimited atonement because it's biblical. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, it says Christ died for our sins, not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. He says it again. And then in chapter 5, verse 19, the same book, John says... John says... When we know that the whole world lies in the lap of the wicked one. He's talking about the whole world. Unbelievers and believers, Christ died for everyone. Doesn't mean everyone will be saved. But it does mean that when you tell somebody, hey, Christ died for your sins, it, you're telling them the truth. Jesus did die for all your sins, past, present, and future. Verse 9 says, Much more than having now been justified by his blood that's on the cross, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. This seems, it, it's in the, in the future tense, we will be saved from the wrath of God through Jesus Christ. Because we've owned Christ and Christ has owned us. When he comes in his kingdom, we're going to be the ones delivered out of and from this vile world and delivered safely into his kingdom. That is deemed salvation. We know that there's no salvation eternally from our sins apart from the death, burial, and resurrection. But we also know there's no deliverance from evil for this world and for us into his coming kingdom apart from the second coming of Christ. Look in verse, the last part of verse 9. It says, We will be saved from the wrath of God through him. And then verse 10, for while we were enemies, we were, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. If we've already been reconciled to God and we're his friends now, we're in his family now, doesn't it make perfect sense that in the future in the coming kingdom, we will be saved from his wrath and delivered safely into the kingdom. That's what he's talking about. We shall be saved, future tense, by his life. Verse 6 says that we are helpless, ungodly, impious, wicked. I'm adding some synonyms here that are in the dictionary. Verse 8 says we're all sinners, both Jew and Gentile. Verse 9 says we're deserving of the wrath of God. Verse 10 says we are enemies of God. 
and yet we are reconciled. We're brought back into relationship with him. Why would God be motivated to do this? There, listen very closely, there is no mystery to that. It's because he loves us. Wouldn't you want to be reconciled to one of your wayward children? A child that you gave birth to, that was made in your image, that your heart pounds for, and they walked away from you, and now they come back? There's no mystery whatsoever in why you would want that to be. It's because of your love and because of his love for us. When God sees this vile world and he sees what's happening in this world, when you turn on the TV or you're watching something on the news and you're thinking, man, this is terrible. Do you not think that it breaks God's heart? Whether it's abortion, whether it's child pornography, whether it's some kind of abuse, mental abuse, academic abuse, any kind of abuse. Don't you think that breaks God's heart? These are people that are knit together in their mother's wombs in the image of God. It breaks his heart. Don't you think that his wrath is becoming... He's, he's getting enraged. And he's, everything in the scripture says he's going to expel that wrath on the earth when he comes again. We're going to be delivered from that. Safely and safely put, brought into his kingdom. Where righteousness and truth reign. Where the knowledge of the Lord covers the earth like the water covers the sea. It's going to be a good time. It's going to be a good time. One more. Pa Actually, I'm, I'll save this till next week. Um, the, um, I'm going to save it for next week. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for your love for us. And we feel the angst. We strive in this world. Like the person in Isaiah 59, we look at what's going on in the world and we say, why isn't there any justice? There's no justice. There's not righteousness executed and we live in the, probably the most just country in the world at this time. And Father, our spirits are quenched. We can only imagine how your spirit is quenched. And how you are storing up wrath and judgment for this world. We know Jesus is coming again. And we believe every single word. He's going to right every wrong. Our desire now, Father, is to be a vessel of grace and truth to this vile world. People are hurting around us. I pray that each one of us would be a man or woman or young person that brings people grace and loving kindness there's no telling what they have suffered at the hands of the enemy, the world, the flesh, and the devil. They need forgiveness. They need to be reconciled to you. They need the grace that we've received. They need to experience the love of God. And I pray that we would become those vessels of the love of God to the people around us. That we would be light, salt, and light to a dying world. We wouldn't criticize the people in the world or even the world itself, but we would be salt and light and vessels of grace. We love you, Father, and we thank you for the truth that we have in your word. We want to worship you and remember the Lord Jesus Christ until he comes. In Jesus' name, amen.